<laughs> go. Go. One day, I'm going to give up writing and just paint. I'm going to give up painting and just sing. I'm going to give up singing and just sit. I'm going to give up dying and just love. I'm going to give up loving and just right. More? More? What? Hey everyone, uh, welcome to uh, Revolutionary Vision Towards the Cultural Offensive. Um, I'd like to open our conference today with a poem by Jack Hirschman. It's called, it's called Him. I am at home, you are at home. Inside, the children are asleep in their room. Inside, I am working under the lamp of the poem. For Jack Hirschman, poetry and art were a lamp to guide us through the night. And we need that guidance now more than ever. We're lost, torn apart, and often wandering on the edge of a reality that seems out to swallow us and spit us back out onto the pavement where we'll be stomped out and forgotten. The purpose of this conference today is to be that lamp that we need to light our way and find the tools we need to build a better world. A world based on cooperation instead of corporation. Jack may be gone from the world, but his words remain with us always. And we hope that this conference will be a guiding light towards justice and peace and the beginning of the end for fascism. Let's build the world that Jack wanted us to build. And now I'll turn it over to Anna Lombardo. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, welcome to Revolutionary Vision Toward the Cultural Offensive. Poetry, please forgive me for helping you understand that you are not just made up of words. These are some lines of a poem by Rock Dalton, a poet from San Salvador, much loved by the beautiful soul of Jack Hirschman, who translated some of his works into English. And I use those lines in particular here as a metaphor for this conference today, a revolutionary vision toward the cultural offensive. It's true, for me it is. Poetry is not words. Is something else that creates awareness that makes us understand what's happening in this beautiful world. And this was Jack's idea, Jack's vision, which we want to honor today all together. This conference is a call to unite our efforts, creativity, arts, to oppose the old and new form of fascism the offensive of the corporations and the capitalism, the discriminations, the wars that are devastating our lives and our planet too. This conference is not only about poetry then, but rather about what poetry can do and how to arouse awareness about all the injustice around the world. It's our first step and I very much welcome everyone for joining us today and I thank from the bottom of my heart, Jack, for his vision. It touched so many lives and souls. It was deeply rooted in his poetic vision of the world. My thoughts go also to a beloved uh, wife, Aggie, my friend, and to all who loved and praised him. We have lost a lot, but after his passing, sorrow and emptiness, his idea gave us the strength to continue his work. And I'm proud and happy to do this today with all of you. So I thank all the comrades, poets and artists joining us today and whoever wants to continue Jack's works with us. It's a step to make constructive and concrete Jack's vision. 
Today's conference is divided into two sessions with two panels followed by discussion. The two relevant topics are, the first one is fascism toward today, sorry, and the danger of war. Esso Estrada will moderate the panel. After musical break, the second panel, which issues revolutionary vision in cultural works and next step, will be moderated by Greg Pond. My name is Anna Lombardo. I'm a poet, a cultural activist, and a freelance translator, and I live in Venice. Uh, let me thank all of you again before passing the microphone to Esso Estrada. Some words about Esso. She is Oh. She's an, education, an educational activist, professor, and poet. She's a member of the League of Revolutionary for a New America, the People's Response Network to COVID-19, CPS Stick Out, and the Cook County College Teachers Union. She owns Barrio Blues Press, a charity press based out of Chicago. And let me to say she is a generous and wonderful soul. To you, Esso. <laughs> God bless you, comrade. Thank you. That was beautiful. So we have um, uh, the amazing Ran Dibble, who is going to read a poem for us, followed by Eric. And um, Ran, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, I'm, I'm Randall Dibble. I come from the upper shores of Lake Michigan, uh, born at, with a red diaper wearing a baby as a red diaper baby with a union label on my butt to come some radical UAW uh, members. I have the honor today to uh, read the statement that ha Jack had presented to uh, this committee. And in his effort, he wanted to see that we have a cultural committee for LERNA, as well as this cultural conference. Now, what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to attempt to channel Jack, okay? But I'm not able to reproduce his uh, soft Bronx brogue. Some hillbilly might sneak in, and I'm sure with his angel on my shoulder, he'll poke me in the ear if I don't do him justice. But what I'm going to do next is instead of you looking at my ugly mug, I'm going to have Jack's up here so you can look at that. So... He wrote this and presented it at the proposal of this conference, as well as the Cultural Committee. Towards a cultural conference. On the day in 1943, when I was 10 years old and playing with friends in the alley alongside the four family house on Wheeler Avenue in Bronx, where I lived, the window on the second floor opened. And my terrified mother, Nellie, cried out, Jack, if the Russians don't defeat the Nazis in Stalingrad, the Nazis are going to go to London, and then they're going to come here. My mother's fright began my lifelong struggle against fascism. We know also that since World War II, this country has been in the hands of modern fascists. It's wise to remember Mussolini's words. Fascism isn't the correct word. The correct word is corporatism. The crooked tax evading corporations have been controlling this country for the past 73 years, upholding and sustaining the capitalist ruling class over the working class. In the course of these same years, the US has become the imperial cop with 800 military bases in virtually every country on the earth. The people of Haiti know this imperialism as they were occupied by the US in 1915. The US has also threatened the Soviet Union the hope of true democracy for the people of the world out of existence. It has seen to it an implicit, if not open target of its gun, that not a single communist shall be represented, our people, either in the Senate or the House of Representatives. This is how complete corporate fascism has been. And that is why I have uncovered a spark that hopefully will lead to the cultural offensive against fascism. It is essentially important that poetry now be a weapon in the struggle to specifically overthrow the capitalist system everywhere. I say poetry in particular 
is key to the heartfeltness of the mind and soul, which will be emphasized by graphic work, of course, and even music. But I insist that the international acceptance of hip hop poetry all over the world, in addition to the development of revolutionary poetry in each state of the United States, poetic action can no longer be dismissed as filler or decoration. Such weaponry has a history in the past 90 years. The most important activity in the name of communist people of the world was the formation of the international brigades that came to Spain in the late 1930s from all over the world to fight the fascism of Germany, Italy, and Spain in defense of the recent loyalist government of that country. In 1980s, the Roque Dillon Cultural Brigade was formed in San Francisco, named after the great communist poet of El Salvador, which dealt with Central American liberation movements. In the same decade, the Jacques Roumain Culture Brigade was formed for the struggle of Haiti, named not only after the great poet of Haiti, but the youngest founder of the Communist Party in the 20th century, CP of Haiti. In 2009, four members of LERNA formed the Revolutionary Poets Brigade, which multiplied in succeeding years, so that there are now five brigades in the United States, two in France, and five more in Italy. Paul's reportage of the activities of peoples economically is not enough. Poetry is key to the future of communalizing by the way of human feelings and heart. It is key to the successful education on the meaning of the new class, because everyone lives poetically within him or herself, along with the dream of a communist world, that this is the ground of the imagination's most affirmative dimension. Comrade Jack, ow, don't poke me in the air anymore, Jack. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful reading. And so now I have the honor and privilege of introducing Eric Allen Yankee, who is one of my favorite Chicago poets. He's going to be reading a poem for you all. Hi, everyone. I'm back here. Um, and I wrote this poem uh, because I felt like, you know, uh, after hearing Jack's piece that Rand just read, uh, that fascism isn't the correct word, it is corporatism. Uh, that's what Mussolini himself had said. Um, and in this country, people will try to convince you that what, what they believe fascism is, and it's usually not the correct definition. So this poem is titled The Beast, which will make sense in a moment. Fascism is not just a black boot to the back of your head or a cold metal gun pressed against your heart. Fascism lives in the dirty streets, the glorified halls of government, and the sterile white boardrooms of the corporations. How can I convince you that fascism sees you always, and that its only goal for you is to break your back, take your wallet, sell your soul to a lie, and then watch you die? Fascism's gnarled hand reaches out as it sucks the oxygen from our air, kicks us when we're down, or dumps thick black chemicals in our water. If you're alive today, you've seen the beast tear at the flesh of your loved ones while it waits for you to step up for your own turn on the Mick altar. Corporations are people too. Corporations are people too. Corporations are people too. Corporatism is fascism and fascism is corporatism. Fascism is when the voice of the corporation is the only voice allowed to speak. So grab your poems, your art, your music, and your souls. It is time to stand together and say, corporations are not fucking people and they do not have the right to speak for us. Thank you. Damn, that was awesome, Eric. This is why I love Eric, awesome. So we're going to uh, go into our first session, which is called Fascism Today and the Danger of War. And I'm going to read some brief files of our presenters. Uh, first, while the Cats Fishman will be presenting, 
She is a scholar, activist, popular educator, and author and professor of, so of sociology at Howard University for 50 years. Recently retired, was a founding member of Project South, Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide. She served on the social justice movement, or she serves, wait, hold on, she served on the National Planning Committee of the United States Social Forum and is active in many social justice movement organizations, including the League of Revolutionaries for New America. Please help welcome all the cats fishmen. And just as a quick reminder, you will have about 10 minutes each. Thank you, hey, Sue and comrades. And um, it's just a real privilege for me to be part of this cultural offensive conference. Um, I know Jack's revolutionary spirit and his fierce anti-fascist fighting um, poetry and, and just persona are here with us today. And I'm just really happy to say that his words are on my bookshelves and his art is on my walls. And so I, I feel so at home. Um, I have a task of trying to put to prose what you all have already said in poetry. Um, in my heart and soul are, are poets and dance. So I feel so at home. I also want to say, so I have two, I have two basic tasks um, in my nine minutes left. One is to locate the fascist um, development of ruling class uh, corporate capitalist forces to, uh, today in the United States in their historic context, which is the history of this country, of this land. I, I hate to say its name because it really is a misnomer, right? Um, but, but it is the United States or America or whatever we're you know, willing and able to call it. So it has a long history of fascist ruling class rule. And I think secondly is to say, because we know that fascism has been part of ruling class uh, strategy and, and the state in this country, as well as around the world, that what makes this moment of 21st century fascism in the, I guess, second decade um, of, or the third, now we're into the third one, of, um, of this, of, of really world history. What makes it different and unique? And therefore, why is this, this life and death moment for humanity and our planet to be able to defeat fascism, to defeat the capitalist corporate forces that are driving this um, road of state terror and death and brutality. So to open up, I just wanna say, I am a very proud daughter of New Orleans. I was born a uh, third generation and grew up in New Orleans. And as I was growing up, I'm a boomer, which means I was born in the 40s. And my first three decades of life were in the South of this country under uh, Jim Crow, white supremacist fascist rule, when the ruling class of the South, the, the political party that they were housed in, was what we call the Southern fascist wing of the Democratic Party, AKA the Dixiecrats who then became Republicans. So I, I experienced this in a different way than Jack, but, but you could see this, this terror of white supremacy and um, in police terror in, in the streets, in the homes of, of working class people uh, where I grew up. So first about this question of history and this question of war. Um, the United States, has been at war against its own people. So we have been in a class war since the inception of this country. And someone alluded to the 800 bases and the um, gazillion dollars over the centuries that, that you know, US government has put into the war machine. So we are really in a moment of great danger, not only of the annihilation of our class, but the annihilation of the whole planet, given new technologies of warfare. But it really begins a very long time ago at, with genocide, the genocide of indigenous peoples, 
the uh, transatlantic slave trade and the brutal enslavement of, of African descent peoples in this country in the hemisphere um, as chattel, as chattel. Um, and, and that has been a, a building block of this country um, that we cannot escape. And that has changed its form over the six centuries of our existence, but it is still a brutal state terror of if we don't need you to make profit for us, we will incarcerate you, we will kill you, we will murder you for your land um, and for your labor. And so that is a long history. I wanna just lift up, I'm a sociologist and, we, and I'm a historical materialist. So the constitution of this country, again, as Eric alluded to, only recognized private property as a right, the right of the ruling capitalist class to own property. You can search the constitution for any indication that in the history, there was any recognition of the rights, the human rights of working class people. And that happens to be a fact. So we need to absorb that because it will go to what we have to do to break the stranglehold of, of, of corporations and their vicious state upon our lives. Um, besides the fact that white supremacy is the core strategy of ruling class to both divide our working class, we have always been a multiracial, multigendered, multinational working class, and yet we have been lied to, lie upon lie. But white supremacy was the essential tool to divide us along the color line. And that has been a recurring theme across the centuries. Before I fast forward and, hey Sue, tell me how many minutes do I have left? Three? Um, you have about five minutes left, a little dinner. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to the defeat of, um, I'm gonna speak to the civil war and the immediate defeat of reconstruction, um, which is really very critical for those of us living today, right? Because we don't remember that far back. But the civil war was a war over whether the slaveocracy could continue to own human beings. African descent chattel slaves were not human, they were property. And, and the fight was a multiracial fight with you know, black labor at the center of it. And they won, the civil war was won on behalf of um, wage slavery as opposed to chattel slavery, right? But, but it was won and, and you know, that kind of extreme legal white supremacy was, was put on the chopping block and bingo, immediately the ruling class engaged in counter-revolution. So the other thing about fascism and state terror is as people are fighting for liberation, for freedom, for humanity, for earth, corporate ruling class forces will not allow that to happen. And so Jim Crow and brutal terror was brought to bear and to rain upon the land, predominantly in the South, but across the nation. And I want to say one thing before I fast forward to the technological revolution of today. Um, scholars have now documented fully that the anti-Jewish laws of Nazi period were modeled after the black codes of the Jim Crow era. And so it is the US and this fight to control our working class with black labor at the heart of it and indigenous land at the heart of it that, that really um, sparked this, this, this fascist offensive of the ruling class in the post-Civil War period that was not ended until the 1960s and now we're in the the reemergence of a fascist defensive of the ruling class. So what makes this moment of fascism 
different or of the motion toward fascism by corporate ruling class forces. And it has to do with uh, what is at the heart of the economy, which is the technological revolution, digitization, computerization, robotization, and automation. All of those technologies of production, communication, distribution, and, and even reproduction and reproduction are now labor replacing rather than as in the machine industrial age, labor enhancing. And that means two things very quickly. One, it means that labor is less and less needed. And if the ruling class does not need us to make profit off of our blood, sweat and tears, then it does not need us, period, right? It incarcerates, but now we've seen massive killing and slaughter, not only of our own people here in this country, but globally. So, so a people that cannot be employed are going to be dispossessed and allowed to die or to be killed. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is, um, that in this moment, we are rising up. You can see it. Um, I was part of social forum. There was Occupy, Black Lives yeah, Matter. Okay, and the indigenous struggles. And so as that motion rises, the state is going to crack down on us. So those are some of the things historically and in this moment. And um, I know we're gonna talk about vision because that's what's gonna get us out of here. Thank you. That was beautiful. Originally from San Francisco, Tango Asen Martin is a poet, movement worker, and educator. His latest curriculum, An Extrajudicial Killing of Black People, We Charge Genocide Again, has been used as an educational and organizing tool throughout the country. He is the author of the poetry and essay collection, Someone's Dead Already, Heaven is All Goodbyes, Waiting Behind Tornadoes for Food, and the forthcoming Blood on the Fog. He is San Francisco's 8th Poet Laureate. It is a pleasure and an honor to have Tango Asen Martin give a talk to us today. Take it away, comrade. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, today, the ruling class and their millions of shock troops maintain their power with what must be a really enjoyable racism. Streamlined fascist accomplishing in mass perpetually starts resistance of having people who would actually populate resistance. Corporate hired artists scribble sunshine on cop tires. The U.S. publicly and privately contracts construction of new concentration camps for asylum seekers. The neo-colony of Flint, Michigan, poisons Black residents on a scale that should be a biological weapon war crime. There are as many people cleaning rich people's houses as there are people in prison. And we have a revolution with a serious lack of revolutionaries. The police state will never unloom. So we're going to have to uh, decide what sacred means. We're going to have to defang and um, de-alter cloth our individualism. The current epoch of resistance seems to be oriented around immediate demands instead of mass politicization of the people, uh, which keeps us ever isolatable and structurally absorbable. Instead of raising confidence in the people that no empire is permanent, and no oppression is infinite, no matter how long or deeply suffered. We march to gain new demarcations of whiteness. We save our tempers for dance floors. We sip television-based firewater and work for the perfection of counter-revolutionary slang. I sort of went back to school today or found bullet, bullets in some squalor, found the modern two-ness of a historical non-white self-actualization and what better my great grandmother knew. What my great grandmother knew is that it's not enough to have the effect of a concept. You need the function of a concept. Or never mind organizing our way into the concession of an equitable social atmosphere. We need instruments of people power and revolution. We need a mass of people who find oppression unacceptable. 
I wonder if all the way from a South Texas refrigerator incarcerated children can make out our faces. Wonder if we are now officially a historical tangent. Wonder what kind of customer I'll make as a white man. What kind of August I'd be avoiding if it's in the endowments that the devil takes his bed rest. Tomorrow's rulers and rulers extra special cogs wearing t-shirts that you can subtitle universe last country first. Whiteness is the only thing in the society that is not obsolete. In a service economy, everything, especially organizing, feels like it's being part of a temporary history. Instead of single issues, we have to expose all conditions of oppressed people, advance a political program that exposes the entire institutional reality of oppression. What reformism leaves us with is the need for consciousness to be overwhelmed by spontaneity and to sacrifice revolutionary consciousness for a commitment to action. Spontaneous uprising is not, I mean, as we all see, <laughs> it's not the inauguration of a revolutionary stage of society. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Admittedly, action-oriented organizing is understandable, uh, given that one of the great organizational challenges is to keep people from feeling like they are not doing significant enough work. And also, um, you know, more importantly, single issue struggle interrupts a few of our people's or a lot of people's despair. Uh, but our performance art cannot keep up with such an extroverted empire. And we, not, and we cannot give into the despair of a total loss of belief in the people's revolutionary potential. Revolution is a conscious mass seizing of all agencies of power, service, production, and institutions of socialization. From the cobalt tropics of San Francisco to Mars and back, oppressed and oppressed exist in permanent contradiction. We therefore have to analyze the structure of our efforts with how reconcilable our structures are with the system, how policeable is our movement, how policeable are our people, how international are our potentials. It's tempting, even therapeutic, to, to subscribe to a soup of theories, but what happens when we subscribe to the soup is that we actually do not get one theory or another, rather we get the absence of all theory, which leads to people making up some kind of esoteric eclectic view that justifies whatever activity they are engaged in, a resulting uh, ideology, non-ideology that is not revolutionary, and, but still dangerously strong because it is more developed, codified, rationalized, and lived with. Uh, we have been meeting, you know, we have been meeting people's needs meeting people where they are at while the ruling class and state apparatus are marching us into all marching us all into oblivion as a result of this commitment to single issue action organizers don't raise the consciousness of those participating in the single issue struggle single issue struggles do not require them to and in some cases actually requires organizers to tell lies and claim easy victories we are out here, uh, not to be too cute, <laughs> we're fighting with our eyes tied behind our backs or, or fighting while doing uh, spiritualized drugs, happy to have just one less liquor store washing up to shore, happy with the fear we put into that person working at a front desk, happy with our, you know, 80s babies, ballot savvy, some part of us always attempting to keep our master alive. Our guiding objective has to be to build towards a national movement of uncompromising politics, internationalist solidarity and continuity of principled struggle. Revolutionary movement does not exist without a revolutionary theory. Revolutionary movement does not exist without bringing masses of people into a revolutionary process. We have to come to terms with this reality if we ever plan on getting uh, Pangea off of this white settler colonial merry-go-round. Apologies for the times. I was <laughs> sorry for the for the snarky parts of that. Oh, <laughs> no apologies. <laughs> not bad, Tongo. You got to give me all of us. We want a copy of that talk. While I got day. you. I got you. Are Thank you good? You very much. Again, comrade, or do you have a, you got more time? Or are you good? Say, say, say again. I like three more minutes. Or are you done? Oh yeah, I thought I was done. That was brilliant. I'll try to keep it, <laughs> right on, right keep it, keep it PG thirteen. That was beautiful. Um, right on, you're, you're getting a lot of love in the chat a lot of love um all right very good so next we have james tracy who is a bay area native and a poet and community organizer he is co-founder of the san francisco community land trust and is on staff at community housing partnership 
He is the author of Dispatches Against Displacement, Fuel Notes from San Francisco's Housing War, as well as co-author of Hillbilly Nationalist, Urban Race Rebels and Black Power, Community Organizing in Radical Times. With Hillary Moore, he is most recently co-author of No Fascist USA. Please help welcome uh, James Tracy. Sorry. Hey everybody, it's uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with League of Revolutionaries for New America and uh, sibling travelers of the same. Uh, but I first met Jack and Sarah Menifee and Carol Tarlin and the crew back in the 90s when Lerna, in my humble, this is not a dig on non-Lerna groups, but I, let me just say that Lerna seemed to be one of two uh, socialist organizations operating in San Francisco that was genuinely concerned with what was going on in public housing at the time. And it was an honor to work alongside, especially Sarah, but everybody else uh, and Jack showing up in North Beach public housing uh, and uh, fighting together. And I learned so much, uh, you know, through di dialogue, arguments, uh, joint action together. And I really miss Jack. I've always missed walk, always being able to walk into Specs and buy the People's Tribune, uh, no matter what. So, um, yeah. Um, so, here to talk, shift here and talk about fasc uh, fascism a little bit. Uh, if I present anything that is contradictory to uh, anybody else's understanding, let's do that in the spirit of debate, dialogue, because we are all about uh, getting rid of fasc fascism. It's the only question in front of us is how and when. Um, so to, currently, I think amongst uh, those of us who oppose fascism, uh, there are kind of two different debates. Uh, one, or viewpoints. One sees fascism as Americanism, and it's just a simple outgrowth of s s uh, settler colonialism. And the other, uh, sees fascism as, as an aberration of the United States uh, project that is uh, constantly being, Im, you know, improved and, you know, the constitutional uh, arrangements being something that can, can always be Im, improved. And somehow these, uh, these polls have to work together, right? Because uh, no, uh, no one group of people uh, can um, you know, can fight fascism because it's bigger and badder than it has been in a quite uh, quite a long time. Personally, I subscribe to the fact that it, uh, to the viewpoint that it is an outgrowth of settler colonialism, as our uh, many of our good friends Roxanne Dunbar Artiz has really pointed out, and Nick Estes, and many you know many many scholars um, over the over the years. Um, but I think that it is important to recognize that fascism in its current form is bigger and badder than it has been in quite a few years, probably since the, the 1980s. And within that, I locate, uh, I look, locate a kernel of optimism, because if fascism is, you know, it is part of the American system, but also something that has been fought that it sometimes has had less power than it has, then that means that we can fight it, right? You know, that means that there is a uh, the collective action uh, and, uh, you know, and people com coming together, whether that be in the streets or whether that be uh, doing intellectual work or cultural work, that means, you know, fascism does not have to be a permanent um, feature of our um, of our lives of of our society, uh, so, but we should we should address we should look at that in a way that uh, that is completely sober to the fact about how durable it has you know it has been. Keep in mind that in the nineteen twenties, the Democratic Party came up two votes of of around a platform uh, came short two votes of condemning the KKK back in the, you know back in the day um, and that and that was a time when the Klan had its own baseball teams and civics clubs and was starting to experiment with what has really been only perfected a hundred years ago I mean hundred years after uh, which is uh, you know, which is the mainstreaming of fascist ideas so you don't have to be a total fascist to be influenced by fascist uh, ideas, which is why the cultural offensive that we're here to talk about is, um, you know, so, so massively important. So 
with my good friend Hillary Moore, I co-wrote a book called No Fascist USA. We didn't get too creative with that uh, with that title at all, uh, but we looked at a you know a small network of uh, of leftists that the John Brown Anti Klan Committee that were mostly active in the uh, in the 1980s, and they really for despite you know their despite their lack lack of numbers, they were also pretty influential in. Uh, today as far as you know some of the norms that we think about what it means to be an anti anti-fascist the the no platforming the street mobilizations the constantly being willing to uh to confront fascism wherever it may be deny fa fascist opportunities to uh, spread spread their lives and they did a lot of really good uh good things certainly like any any organization made their mistakes here and there uh but what was what was interesting to me is about how they learned how to fight a cultural offensive and whether that was uh, intervening when uh, Oprah Winfrey was uh, platforming Nazi skinheads on TV. Many of us may remember that moment and also remember that the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee mobilized anti-racists and anti-racist skinheads to actually intervene in the studio audience and, and but also their um, their their uh, their use of music, particularly punk rock at the time, uh, to have a cult a uh, a cultural offensive to reach angry young people before the fascists got to them, right? Because when we are in populist moments, um, populist moments, it really comes to who's willing to do the organizing, who's willing to come and do the talk. Because where I grew up, Vallejo, California. Uh, the Nazis showed up right about this time. That's where I first met the John Brown anti plan Committee, and you know they um, they 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 make they can make a really good case uh, to young alienated white kids about why their enemies are black and brown and Jewish instead of corporate uh, the corporations and 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 the police. And it's really. Uh, at this point in one's in one's development, it's really about who gets to people first and who, um, you know, who fights the war of position and in, inside people's hearts and minds. And music, and poetry is a big part of that because even though fascism is it has has a big element that's about the material conditions, it's not about that. It's also about the spiritual con conditions. It's also about one's identity and place in the world and sense of se sense of sense of power and the John Brown anti-clan committee took a lot of influence from the fantastic movements in the UK rock against racism that confronted Thatcher and the street far right through through bringing together black white Indian youth uh, through through music and through concerts and I think most people who have been politicized to the left can remember you know a piece of a piece of art a book a record that really helps solidify their long lasting commitment beyond the single issues as Tongo said, right? That uh, whether that's uh, the Public Enemy uh, album in 1989 for some of us or the Clash, Sandinista, you know, these are the things that solidify and, and change our very, um, very common sense over, over time. I think we need to think big, engage with mass media uh, because you know, we're seeing right now kind of a split within the fascist movement. We have a very system loyal fascism uh, that wants, uh, and we have a system oppositional uh, one, and that is going to drive to, uh, to you know, to many splits as we saw, you know, uh, fascism, I, I do agree that it's part corporatism, but it's not all corporatism, you know, it's, uh, it's a, um, uh, you know, it's uh, you know there are parts of of of, uh, of the corporate power structure that fascists are very antagonistic towards. We you can, and and the mass media, you could just watch MSNBC for uh, elements of that. And as we as you know, as the left, we have to be able to uh, provide alternatives. We have a minute left. Great, I only need thirty seconds. Um, provide alternatives both to the liberal vision of anti anti fascism as fa and and fascism uh, in general so again it's uh it's an honor to be here honored to be part of this uh this dialogue and uh 
Thank you, Lerna, for your decades there uh, in the trenches. Uh, uh, much love to all of you, and uh, I will uh, I, I will wind down now. Thank you. That was outstanding. So comrades, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a short five minute break because I have to be here the whole time. Um, why don't you think about questions, comments you wanna ask the panelists for about five minutes and then I'll come back and um, we, can, we can start the discussion which will go until 1245. So we'll have a good chunk of time to talk. Yeah. Thank you, Scott, do you wanna ask a question? Sure, uh, thank you. I am uh, just wondering about the use of mass media to advance the cultural agenda. Uh, it's, it seems, I mean, how many poets, artists, musicians here have been silenced or blocked by the Facebook algorithm? How do we combat uh, putting our voice and art out there in this so-called social media that is anti-socialist? Uh, any other panelists want to take that one? Rand will speak for that. And I'll say something quick after yeah, Go ahead, Walda. Uh, I think actually, let's get the panelists purview first and then other people. Go ahead, Walda. Yeah, I mean, you know, I spoke about the new digital technology and its production, its communication, its warfare, right? It has transformed everything. And so I think that part of, you know, part of the fight for the space, you know, the corporate media are not going to give us the space. Let's just right. be honest, right? You know, we're their enemy in, in a lot of ways. They're ours. And so we just need to recognize that. And so I think alternative forms, um, I work with a group called May First People Link, and, you know, they're a movement uh, tech force. And so I think it has to be part of our tactics and strategy. Okay. I mean, that's really all I can say. It's like, how are we going to get, you know, Capitol Hill where I live to pass any goddamn thing and we can't. So, so let's build the struggle for, for the voice, right? For voice and airtime and technology to tell our stories. Uh, let's build that into our, our war plan. Okay. And because this is cultural offensive, it would be great if some action steps, right? You know, to connect to wherever the, the radical movement media are and, and to figure out how we build up our forces. Pass. Awesome, James, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with everything. I believe in building all forms of movement infrastructure, especially cultural ones, because as you correctly said, you know, the cultural, the, the mainstream media is not going to let us in all the time, but there are breaks when there are people's movements and there's a cultural expression, the power of, of international pop star like Dua Lipa uh, speaking out in, in favor of Palestinian rights is something that's powerful and reaches and amplifies the message, but the foundation has to largely be built through the mechanisms that Walda just, um, uh, ju uh, just, uh, just outlined. Mm -hmm. And Marcus says, uh, culture is about a way of life. Native people are not about events, but belief, traditions, and struggle to get our land back. With this working together against the state, its role, tools of oppression. Oh, this is a question. I'll, I'll save it, but it says, what is the vision as many Native views, and what is the next world about? That, to me, the culture workers can express. So I think it's more of a statement. Um, I see you, Rand. Uh, Tango, do you want to answer this question about social media? Yeah, I, I, Matt, you know, maybe the, 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 the riddle is the answer to the question in a weird way of like, what are, how, how are we, um, how are we communicating? How are we relating messages outside of social media? And can we, because, you know, a, a, a few, a few decades ago, they could get 40,000 people into the street like this with 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 no, uh, with no Facebook and no anything. So what's going on in our and the rest of our, uh, you know, our modes of communication uh, that have deteriorated so much that to where social media seems yeah. like the only form of of getting of, of getting message and 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 anything else um, out. And 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 though we're you know we're we're starting in a deep hole still you know with with this kind of uh, 
you know, still being in a, in a pandemic, I think we, we have to mind the world that we have constructed for ourselves or organized for ourselves um, outside of, because even, you know, e even, you know, people's engagement of information um, is, is so passive. Yeah on the screen and it's almost part of a kind of a neurotic you know people pe people pick the phone up when they're nervous when they're scared when they want to just zone out right and so what how do you exist how do you how, how do we have almost mental relationships with each other in a in, in spaces that are not already kind of quicksand is the is the is is really is the is the is the nowhere to go but up scenario is the good is the good news but yeah. that's what i put my mind that's what i employ is to, to, to keep our minds on okay like like the old school communication old school relationships and, and sh ensuring that up because right now in, in, in conclusion we really are living on different planets at this point and i don't think like Petty bourgeoisie knows how far they are, <laughs> how far they are from the proletariat, or how far they are from the lumpen, whatever. All these, you know, all these. Said, we, we're actually operating in different, much different modes, yeah. and so you know, getting back down into the like the real gravel of common denominator is, is I think, is actually step one, and actually where you synthesize even synthesize even better. Uh, calls from, right? Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that 100%. In fact, I was going to speak to that. But Rand, you want to speak to social media? Yeah, well, the media overall, having been a, a longtime, lifelong musician and COVID, it took two of my acts away and I've just had but one now. Um, I can just agree with Tongo about the world's on its head or two different planets. In the past, when I was young, we would fire up our little transistor radio on the edge of the lake, try to get WLS. And if it wasn't on WLS or pop radio, AM radio, it wasn't happening. That the big record companies and the distribution apparatus they had around that was in charge and you had to get a record deal to be heard. Things are backwards now or better. I would encourage to view it. The market has been broke up and segmented to the point that Touring in the past was to support your recording. And today, a recording is just to promote your tour. Now, take it on a smaller level, we're going to have to just recognize as it is, what it is. The market is segmented. So what we can do is to rely upon and recognize that there are click markets. And when there are those click markets, we can prosper. Many acts that I've seen have gone within their rehearsal room, in fact, set up live streaming to Facebook, hard to edit. Facebook's hard to block when it's live streaming. Direct their member, their followers, their friends, and people following their page from their website and stuff to this event and use it to promote their material, their recording, and even ask the other potential venues to hire this band because I'll come and eat and drink if you hire them. So I, uh, I agree with Tongo. I mean, look, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I think social media is making knowledge more shallow and making communication extremely shallow. Like I have a family, I have two small children, 11 and six. We don't allow devices and we eat dinner. We don't take the phone when we're out breaking bread because we want to talk to each other. And it's an addiction for my kids that we got to like, bang, you know, keep that shit moderated. But I, I do think that social media offers the opportunity to come together. Like I'll give you an example. If it hadn't been for Twitter, I would not be at the forefront of the CPS Sickout movement right now in Chicago, statewide, nationally, not globally. That could only happen because of social media with meeting other parents and activists and doctors and nurses that are fighting against COVID. But I do think that, and this is a subjective thing for me because I've been terrified during this pandemic. I only go out when I'm doing a rally or a political cause or speaking against like, um Biden's wife or whatever but I find it so much so so beneficial to break bread with the organizers to meet with people one-on-one -on -one, even though there's a pandemic that I am going back to old school one-on-one -on -one conversations because it's not enough to post something and say hey we're gonna have this big board action come support a handful of people will come but if I talk to people one-on-one -on -one, if we talk about what our commonalities are then hopefully they'll come to the event. So I think it's gotta be a balance of both. 
But I do agree with Tango that we got to figure out ways of communicating and coming together at an old school level. Now I'm proud of being a boomer. Now, fuck it. I don't care. I'm old, dude. I'm going to be 50 in a few more months. And I said it. But I think it's important to come back to those face-to-face -face interactions and, and talk to people um, because a lot of people right now are alienated because of the pandemic, right? And we got to break out of our silos by any means necessary, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's having human social interaction, you know, but I do think social media has this positive. Now, I'll tell you this, when Facebook and Instagram went down, I didn't give a shit because I was taking a half day nap because I had Discord where all the youth are at, right? I had Twitter, I had, um, you name it. So if we're going to use the weapons of the ruling class, let's use as many as we can. You know, Facebook goes down. I don't care. I'm going to come over here. And uh, I, too, have been banned. For, I got I got in Facebook jail. I think I said something like punch a motherfucking fascist in the face or something. And they said I was inciting violence and I got blocked on Facebook and Twitter. So then I created an alternate account, you know. So, I mean, there are ways of getting around it. Just just don't incite violence and you should be OK, because I also cuss like a sailor and I'm fine. But uh, Eric was saying that his political posts seem to be censored more than they were a few years ago. I think that's that's true. You know, Facebook is trying to make amends for having all these fascist groups, but too little, too late, right? Um, so I have on stack Sarah and Anna. Sarah, go ahead. Okay. You know, um, I used to be back in the days we were free range kids. We were out there in gangs away from adults, you know, stealing liquors, climbing trees, getting in fights. Um, it's, it's just so different now. You know, we, we were not mediated. We were not controlled. Um, I'm not saying that they were good times. They were very backward times. But I, I think that's coming around again. And I think, I think that social media is a sort of a virtual way to gather, but I don't think it's any, you know, it's controlled by the corporations. So their algorithms, I think their algorithms get drunk and just get crazy. You know, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm sort of losing my train of thought. I, it's, we've got to figure out how to come together and organize. And we're going to use the tools at hand. We really have to. We really have to create create our own, you know. But on the on the other hand, you know, the infrastructure is owned by the capitalists, so we have to use it consciously. Um, the I wanted to refer to something that Scott Bird, who raised this, uh, said in our gathering, a speak out that we had yesterday here in San Francisco, um, that really struck me because I knew some of these kids, the street kids that basically out there in tribes and using social media to organizing, but, but showing up on the street showing up on the street. And I, I'd like to hear you express that again, Scott, because, because I experienced that, especially among the street kids that were around Occupy and how something, some um, marriage of the absolute street, these are people that live on the street, right? Uh, they, they can't go into their isolated cells. But they're also using these these forms of communication to uh, to organize. So um, I don't know. I don't think I lost my train of thought. I, I I don't mean you should jump the queue here, Scott. But I I like to hear you describe that again because it was really interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, if Scott wants to respond to that, and then Anna and Lou. Scott, did you want to respond to uh, Sarah's question? It was just a, it was just a beautiful moment. I work as a gardener in the city, and uh, several of the young people who are coming on to uh, to work um, are all, like Sarah said, they're street kids. And one of my friends, Eve, was homeless for four months when she first moved to San Francisco. She's a young transgender rebel from Colorado Springs, and. I mean, the modus operandi of them was that they lived out front of the federal building in San Francisco, 
um, and were raided by the police continually um, and were called to the rallies in Berkeley whenever the neo-fascists would come to speak there. Um, and so in a way, the, the revolution and the cultural work of just being out on the street was just a way of life um, for, for all of them and is continually, even if you have to get a big grown up job and, uh, you know, join the labor force so you can exist under capitalism. Thank you, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Okay, Anna. Uh, yeah, I, I was saying that um, about social media, uh, I have two, two, two way to see this, this social media. I don't have Facebook, for example, I, I prefer book than face. And what I noticed, for example, with my friend, with my students uh, in a classroom, as you know, you, they think that you don't notice, but what they do is just stay connected with uh, friends or whatever, but they are not in the real world. They constructed a kind of a virtual world and they don't know uh, when they find themselves in the real world, they don't know how to deal with this, with this world, with their emotion, because it's, of course, it's easy to deal with your emotion uh, through a screen or, or just uh, typing something on, on, on your, on your um, board. But I think that in one way, uh, we have to use this kind of, of uh, instruments just to, to, publish, to make publicity and that of what we, we are doing. But the best way to reach people is, I believe, face-to-face, -face, as, as, uh, uh, as you said before. Uh, for example, yesterday, we, I have an event, and I have to say that all the people that show up were the people that I just uh, contact uh, personally, not through uh, WhatsApp or, or, or email. Because when you talk to the people, um, it, it's, it's, it's different. You know, when you send also messages like, hey, there is this event, they say, I like or I don't like, yes, I come, I don't come. Sometimes they don't say anything really. But at the end, they don't, they are not motivated. I mean, we, we have to find something different. Uh, it's useful from one, from one point just to show what we are doing but it's not constructive in my, in my point of view. Uh, but the other things I'd like to, to pose here is what Wanda, not Walda said, which was very interesting for me. She said something um, uh, connected to the, the, the property. She said, we are not uh, a property. I mean, we are property, not human being. We are seen not uh, as human being. And I was thinking about this concept of property and uh, which is at the basis of capitalism really and uh, together with the other concept of um, uh, let me say uh, utility and these two concepts are attached to our our being our our human being and how we destroy this kind of a concept because i think that beyond all what we are saying and doing um, we have to fight these kind of a concept. We are human beings, we are not property, we are not uh, uh, used for anything, but we can use ourselves for everything. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about poetry, for example. Poetry is, is, is a kind of a present, is a gift that we just give freely. We don't ask money for, for what we write. I mean, Jack, uh, is, uh, was an example for this. And uh, this kind of idea that you do things for free, gratis, is not appreciated by, by the capitalism. And, um, and we, we have to think about this. And, and another thing that uh, I have, it comes into my mind now, is about the time uh, connected with social media. If you need to use social media, you need to have time and you need to have the technology. Now, I don't think that many poor people has this kind of things. For example, in Italy, we, we, we noticed this very well during the lockdown because many, many students couldn't connect uh, to do you know, the, the, um, the work and uh, the lesson through, through Zoom. 
because they didn't have a computer. I mean, five people in, 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 in a family, they didn't have five computers. So when we talk about using this media, we, we have also to think about uh, which kind of people we want to uh, capture. I don't think that many laborers, many workers have two, two or three computers in their homes. Maybe two, three television, but not computers. Okay, that was that. That was my my thoughts, right? Anna, thank you so much. That was beautiful, and I agree one hundred percent. So, Alu, do you have to unmute? I'm going to speed my time because I can come back in the next discussion for you because we're really out of time at this point, and uh, and I know Tango is operating under uh, time constraints. So then uh, I, I'm going to cede my time to the-, to the I thought we were going until 2.45 or, no, we have, that's what the outline says. Am I wrong? Outline says we're going to, uh, uh, oh, you're, oh. Well, we, we have time, Comrade. Right? Yeah, hey, so is right. So go ahead, Lou, go ahead. Say what you got to say. All right, so I, uh, I'll take my time back. It won't take that long anyway. <laughs> um, what I wanted, I, I had two points to make. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. First point is that the media, uh, you know, Scott's asking how to use the media and that sort of thing. Media is a tool. That's all it is. Whether we're talking about social media, whether we're talking about pen and paper, whether we're talking about any of just, uh, <clears throat> just voice, face-to-face, uh, -face, whatever, however we communicate with people is just a tool. It's what we, how we, it's what we communicate that's the most important thing. And uh, we use whatever tools we have, whatever tools available. We use to, for whatever extent we can. Uh, sometimes we have a little crevice to get into. Sometimes it blows its way through and we have a, a big uh, audience to speak to and, and, and that sort of thing. We use whatever we got. Uh, Tongo is now poet laureate of, of the city of San Francisco. I, I can't believe that he's not going to use that, that uh, rostrum to speak his truth and get it out to as many people as possible, right? So, you know, uh, James Tracy published a book. I can't believe that he's not going to, hasn't gotten out in the last couple of years to utilize that. Uh, there's a woman uh, whose name right now, I can't remember her last name, is Rooney, who just published a, a novel. Uh, she normally has her book published in Hebrew as well as in English. She's an Irish novelist. So she has a, a, a publisher in Israel. She refused to let her uh, publisher in Israel publish the book unless it uh, uh, supported Palestinian rights. It's a, it's a minimum, a little lever to use, but it's a lever. You use what you can. On the, the other point I wanted to make is that um, we've got a situation where there are many people in action who haven't been in action before. And Tongo is absolutely right. We're all in silos. We're all, or I, I think we're getting less in silos. I think there are more people who are activists who are speaking the way Tongo did about how we've got to get out of our silos. We've got to connect with other people in their silos that's really key. As long as we remain isolated, as long as there is, you know, that sort of consciousness, then we are definitely going to continue to lose. Um, but it is a question of if we go into people and just meet them where they're at and stay there, that's not doing what we're supposed to do. What poets and writers and musicians have the capacity to do, I think probably more than many other people who just spout facts and figures, is reach across those divides, reach the souls of people, bring them together on that level, kind of what, what Hesu was talking about, rehumanizing her, her humans when she teaches. That's really kind of what we're doing as um, as artists in, in, in this time, and I'm done. Thank you. I was just going to cut you off. Just kidding. No. So just, just take three minutes, comrades. I know I, I'm a big woman with a big
presence and I know I can take up space. So just be cognizant of the three minutes. That was beautiful, Lou. Um, I was going to put myself back on stack and I hope I'm not derailing. And if it is, we can put this issue. I, I had a question for Tongo because um, this, this, this concept he brought up of organizing young, not just young, but white people that have been disenfranchised that are turning towards or armed fascism. Um, it's a challenge for me. And it's partly a challenge for me because I am a woman of color, uh, but I think it's so necessary to, to reach out. Like, for example, there are a lot of poor whites in the South of Illinois who will not get vaccinated. I don't know if I would be the right person to reach out to them, but somebody has to, because their kids are dying. You know, their community members are dying, um, but they're very conservative, pro-Trump kind of people, you know? So I, I don't know if you can speak a little more to that. Uh, maybe Tango, what your experience has been or others, or, or I, I know it's a big pie in the sky question, but how do we organize these young white people who are being attracted by, you know, the, the fascists and what have you? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's 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 a uh, uh, man that, that, that I can improvise a uh, I can improvise a, a response or or really just uh, you know one of the when I when I talk to some veterans uh, of the um, uh, of you know uh, of re revolutionary movements of the you know uh, of the sixties. Uh, they, they they said one of the mistakes we made were was uh, uh, declaring certain people like unorganizable, um, and 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 that that spirit actually infects the way we relate, even to those we would consider our clo our closest comrades, and kind of creates a, a, a culture of, of almost like a, a looming excommunication that is you know that that makes our, our makes our movements easier to um, easier to implode um, I, I think I think J J James uh, uh, can, can speak uh, better though and, and more more specifically to it as he had a, a lot more um, experience uh, with with uh, white people <laughs> <laughs> no but i love it i love that answer um james do you want to take a shot at this one so i think first part is just building off what tongo said is that every organization should uh get rid of its list of who's an or unorganizable right just get rid of that and um, not all organizations can do all things, but and but also recognizing that the catalyst of Black liberation historically has always been the thing that has caused almost all other parts of the working class to ask ask itself, what side am I on, right? So um, I uh, co-wrote a book called Hillbilly Nationalist, Urban Race Rebels of Black, Black Power that looked at the original Rainbow Coalition, but the alliance between the Black Panther Party the Young Lords, and the very, very poor white uh, Young Patriots organization, and every surviving member of the Young Patriots organization, they started off with Confederate flags on their, on their uniform and got rid of them, right? But they talk about how the question was called by the activities of, of, of Black liberation uh, there. So there's a relationship there. But on a much, on a much more technical level, is that organizations need to have uh, know who they're building a base with, right? And know who know know who uh, and have a have a strategy for re for for reaching out that uh, is that is an extremely patient one, right? I've had friends that I grew up with that went the white supremacist route, right? Not just the little white supremacists, but the big one, right? Gr joining up with with um, jo jo joining up with organizations and it didn't work out very well for any of them, right? Because white, su white, white supremacy is by definition, it's a death cult for us all, right? Um, but the, uh, but I've also seen people, you know, uh, people, someone came up to me in Virginia saying that at the time that, um, you know, when they were, when they were exploring and they were being courted by the far right, somebody gave them a copy of the Hillbilly Nationalist and talked with them, right? Sat down one-on-one -on -one and said, no, you're better than that. And you should not go this way, right? You can, you know, solidarity, solidarity is hard. 
it, you know, intercommunalism, as Huey Newton said, is a really hard path and it's a really hard project to build, but it's the thing that's going to pay off for everybody in the um, in, in the end, right? You know, with many painful uh, bumps and on 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 the way. And you know, the Young Patriots or, uh, organization isn't the only example of that. It's not the only example of pe people that are trying to do this work now. Um, not every organization has to, has to dedicate themselves to reaching out to poor white people, but being in in alliance with those, like uh, like the Catalyst Project and many others, um, and you know, I'm, I always take a lot of a lot of inspiration from uh, you know Project South's uh, work over the you know the many decades. You know, I have I have almost all of your guys' books up on on, on the shelf and use it in my teaching all the time. And that's that's really how we how we build the intercommunalism for the 21st century. That'll be slightly different from the 1969 one. And, and can I, you know, I, I, I actually would jump, uh, kind of jump back in it with with an optimism as well. And that I don't think anybody like <clears throat> these 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 times are so uh, kind of ideologically shallow. And because people's experience is is so non-tactile, you know, this kind of this this service economy of, of wasteland actually produces people that can do extreme things, but at root are not their 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 outlooks are are not are, are not as are, are not as entrenched in their in, in their bodies. I mean, what people consciousness are basically just kind of just floating around this you know floating around this corporate uh this, this corporate controlled ether which which sounds you know which, which sounds like a moody poem but actually it, it's hopeful in that if we shore up our organizations you know as organizations that actually start you know producing uh of uh, uh, you know a uh, uh, really start producing a, a revolutionary um process that that one can really immerse themselves in i think it'll be it's it'll be actually it's probably easier than ever to snap something snap someone out of this this, this kind of hegemonic trance that, that they're in right now and, and and so like you know the 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 it, it i think this is ultimately a, a kind of it, it feeds into a bigger kind of vanguard question Right of well, wh what do we have to do to really become potent revolutionary organizations um, again? Thank you. That was incre incredibly inspiring and just amazing. Um, Adam. Oh, was I next on set? I think you were, comrade, because I think it was me then you. So let's let's just go with it. Go ahead. Then Darnell and Waldo. Okay. Well, um, I want to hear from everyone. Um, and there might not be a need to like have a whole discussion, you know, um, after this, uh, if it comes up, it'll come up because I'm just taking in every comment one at a time. And kind of my, my thoughts are all over the place. Um, and really enjoying the rich conversation. And thank you to all of the panelists. I, I, I wrote in the chat, um, Tango kind of uh, inspired, you know, thinking about um, all of the the ways that you framed the issue of siloing were really um, fresh and I think really important. Um, you talk about the ideology of no ideology, and um, I'm thinking about this in relation to you know my practical work, um, and I think we could talk a lot about this, like in theory, about like why do um, we organize around specific issues, which I think, you know, there are obvious reasons why those forms emerge, you know, and, and I think, you know, are, are necessary as well. Um, but then how do we shift toward, you know, uh, this more kind of intersectional and, um, uh, holistic approach to social, uh, struggle. I think cultural workers play a big role in that. And my question is, where do we see um, positive strides happening that we can learn from either historically or in, you know, the present day, but especially 
stuff happening right now. Um, and to uh, I, what models of organizing that we see out there today are working well for bringing multiple issues together and helping people articulate intersections and relationships between their uh, different issues in real practical ways. Um, and again, what role does culture play? I think of space as so, so important. And in the homelessness and housing front of struggle that I've been uh, working in, you know, it's all about space. Um, but everybody needs space. Um, artists also need space to create. And um, when a neighborhood gets gentrified, um, you know, <laughs> at first there's like a lot of spaces for artists, but then eventually, like, there's no spaces for artists because they're all hotels and condos, you know? Um, so I'm thinking about like, what kind of spaces are people creating or reclaiming, whether legally or extra legally, um, that are helping like create the new culture of revolution that we're all talking about and wanting to build. Um, you have about yeah. 30 seconds left. I, yep, I was timing myself, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Who wants to take the who wants to take it? Can we finish this thread first? Absolutely. Did you want did you want to speak to it, Walda? I was on staff for sort of this question of uh, multi rate, and I don't know, was Darnell on stack? Darnell, before? Darnell, Darnell, sweet. Oh, I almost called you, sweetie. I apologize. Darnell, uh, you're, you're next, and then Walda and Sarah. Were you calling me, sweetie? I was. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm just listen. Wait a minute. I don't object. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean, sweetie, you're up. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, my name is Darnell Stephen Summers, and I'm calling you from Berlin, and I'm a Vietnam veteran. And um, I'm in the anti-war movement and have been uh, before I was in the military, during the military and after the military. And what we've been doing is organizing uh, soldiers in the military and outside of the and veterans outside the military. And also um, dealing with people who desert, all kinds of different scenarios that present themselves. So um, I think that I was once before in a, in a grouping like this, uh, talking about cultural issues, you know, and in the work that I do, I'm confronted with all different ethnicities, you know, uh, uh, political persuasions, uh, uh, sexual orientations, colors or whatever. Our message goes out to those who want to hear it. So in, in the first instance, you know, uh, if your if your message is relevant, people are gonna listen to you. You know, so you got an audience out here. That's clear. That's clear because there are people who bear the brunt of oppression and discrimination on a broad front, and a lot of people understand that. They're very they're very in tune to that. I have a, a several links I'm going to uh, uh, send to you now through the chat, which will uh, outline some of the work that we do. You know, some of the things that the soldiers, along with us and other people, have done that you might find interesting. In fact, we're working on a piece now about Afghanistan, you know? So it's important in the work that I do, you know, a lot of times it doesn't occur to people to reach out, you know, you're talking about how can I reach out to people? Or, you know, how, how do I organize them? But it seems that soldiers and vets are, you know, ignored, you know, uh, their experiences you know, they come from the the, 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 the the most oppressed classes. You know, they put the poor people out there to fight their battles, you know? And that does not mean that people who are in the middle class or uh, some other people in higher strata don't, it, the light doesn't go off. And, and and certainly it does. I mean, we had this this Marine com Commandant, Smedley Butler, a hundred years ago say the war is a racket and he was working for some criminals, you know? and. He laid out uh, a, a whole thing, a litany of articles on, on the war in the United States and just uncovered it. I mean, people ought to get into that. Check out Smedley Butler. However, in this day and age, you know, there are people who have a high state of consciousness. And, and it's not, you know, uh, something we all don't have a monopoly on understanding what's going on. And especially if you're in a kind of like the rarefied atmosphere of the military, certain contradictions come to the fore. And we should not forget that, you know. Um, 
the, no, you have about 30 thing. seconds left. 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, oh, actually, I was generous. I, I was generous. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I had said everything I wanted to say, you know. So I, I would I would ask you to check out the um, um, the, the links that I'm going to send you. One is off right at this moment. And let's uh, be very optimistic about because we have a message and art plays a, a great role in all of this. And we got the upper hand. We're on the high ground. Amen, brother. Amen to that. That's beautiful. We have about eight minutes left for the rest of this discussion. Um, let's see, up next was uh, Walda. Yeah, uh, I'll try to be quick. I'll try not to take three. Uh, so a couple of things. One is, you know, we were naming organizations that were intentionally multiracial and spoke to bridging the color line that the ruling class has been so effective in drawing, you know, for us. And so I think the first thing is just don't believe the shit. Okay, it's always been a lie. Um, but uh, besides Project South that James mentioned that, you know, a multiracial team of us organized it. There's another grouping uh, I do work with called Surge Stand Up for Racial Justice. And they have a grouping called Rednecks for Black Lives Matter, which demystifies the whole question of uh, the unity of workers across color, you know, of working class forces uh, historically, actually in West Virginia and elsewhere, particularly in the South. So I think that one, we need to reclaim our history. And two, it's this question of intentionality. As we bring people together, and there's no doubt, I mean, we've been talking about breaking out of silos for about three decades now, right? Um, and there's no doubt, but that if we don't do it, we aren't gonna win because we have a common enemy. Right? We have a common enemy. And if we don't understand that we're a common fighting force of working class people that's always been multiracial and multinational and, and, and multigender, then, then we're definitely not going to win this war, okay, for our very survival. So I wanted to say those things, but also it's to model it. Um, I taught at Howard forever. And so I am in very multiracial spaces. <laughs> probably more because of me than them, <laughs> than my students and my colleagues and my peers. But, you know, it's been a really powerful experience of moving with former students into multiple spaces where other folk can see, both black and white, you know, um, what that unity looks like. You know, it's a common purpose for, for rehumanization as Anna lifted up, you know, our rehumanization and, and yeah. So pass. Awesome, awesome, beautiful. Uh, I, it's lots of chat going on. I believe Sarah is next. Yeah, I'll try to be really brief. You know, um, the homelessness hunger is the Achilles heel of this system. They, they can't fix it under private property or capitalism. That's why they're imposing fascism, right? To keep us divided, to keep us on the defensive, but really objectively we're on, keep us on the defensive, but objectively the situation is we are on the offensive across these lines of division. We are going to have to, to get what we need. That's why I think that the struggles that are based on these survival issues, and these are on all kinds of levels, like we don't want to be killed by police. We want to have enough to eat. We want a roof over our heads. We want health care. You know, we want the things that keep us alive and give us a decent life. And those are being taken away because, because the private property system is absolutely being collapsed by the by the introduction of the technology that makes the ability to give every just get everybody what they need they've got this artificial um you know austerity going on in the midst of plenty and so that's a great unifying thing because because the poverty is absolutely every color in this country. And all they have left are these old divisions that they're whipping up like it's their last gasp, which it is. So I think that that if we, 
in a in an earlier period, we really had ideology like there is a better way, but people were caught in this system because it was basically take you know allowing them to at least survive. We've got a different we've got a different world now. Um, people, we talk about a new class. We talk about people being absolutely thrown out of the relationship they need to capitalism just to eat. So um, there, I think there's a lot of groupings, more organized, some less organized, some just spontaneous or that just arise out of nowhere, like uh, features of Occupy. Um, and, you know, Black Lives Matter comes out of it. Uh, don't kill our children. Uh, so, so I think we're really in a in a new time that seems very dangerous. But the fascism is really an expression of the fact that they are they're done for. They've played out their ability to really run society, and lives are being destroyed. And I think that if we if we keep talking about it on this basis, that we can, I mean, people will have to come. We're out of time, comrade. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That was beautifully said. I agree 100%. So um, stack is open. I don't think anybody else. We have two, two minutes left. If anybody wants to ask one final question. You're getting a lot of love, a lot of agreement. I, I agree 100%. Um, a way for people to say they want to go. Uh, I have been fighting to keep our kids and community safe. And let me tell you, I'm finding allies all over the country and all over the world because their kids are dying and the ruling class isn't doing a damn thing to help them, especially here in Chicago. So that's possible by technology, right? Um, so anyway, I think the objective demands that we're making unify us for sure, you know? So I agree hundred percent. Yeah, it says you're always on point, Sarah. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. Anybody want to ask a question or maybe perhaps our panelists, would you like to make a quick parting shot? I'll just add, you know, it's like every, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big action uh, junkie. I love theory. I love thinking through the, our purposes, but uh, you know, the future really belongs to those who organize, you know, revolution starts with a pen, right? It starts with a clipboard and a door knock and saying, hi, we uh, have it. It starts with an invitation. If anybody ever wants to uh, get in touch for any reason, you're all friends of mine now because your friends are some of my favorite people, um, go ahead and uh, and uh, drop me an email. That I'll put it in the chat. I was just going to say that. We're going to be best friends. We are. Um, anybody else? Uh, uh, Waldo or um, Mijo Tango? I just want to repeat something Tonga said without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary practice. So, so I think it's the dialectic and I think culture sort of helps bring those pieces together, you know, our heads, our hearts and our feet. And I think it is the, the holism and the, the role that that culture and um, and some of us, her educators, think we're part of the culture movement, um, can bring. So it's, you know, reflection and action and keeping the, the fight on the path where we can all have housing and food and, and get our humanity back in the earth, preach, too. Preach, preach. I love it. I love it. We can end on that amazing note. We're actually just a little bit ahead of schedule. Thank you, comrades. I'm going to stop recording briefly and then start up again. But I, I gotta tell you, this has been super amazing and wonderful and um, just really, really just amazing. So we're gonna have our cultural performances next. Thank you for listening to this amazing panel. We hope to see you again soon. If you would like to work with our culture committee, please reach out to learna.org. That's L-R-N-A.org. <laughs>